my questions relate to sunflower lecithin, taking right. sunflower lecithin for fatty liver problem. Okay. And um, I kind of am wondering whether or not there's any data or whether or not you have a sense of how things change like over a year of taking it, particularly in terms of imaging fat in the liver, whether or not that um, just disappears or if it kind of like alters its, uh, you know, how it's located in the liver. Also, um, does weight loss happen after taking sunflower lecithin? And if so, does that happen more likely at the beginning or at the end of a year or unrelated? And also, um, so it sounds like if you have dietary fat, then your sunflower lecithin, if you're taking that, would kind of be tied up in taking care of the dietary fat rather than taking care of the fat that's stored in your liver. Is that correct? Can you say that last part one more time? Sure. Um, so if you are, if a person is taking sunflower lecithin and they're also consuming fat in their diet, which everybody's going to be consuming some kind of fat, right. I guess I'm thinking more of like a keto diet or something where you might be consuming a huge amount of fat. Is that like counterproductive? Um, because the sunflower lecithin. Oh, for, you mean is that is that going to increase the fat in your liver? Um, or does the sunflower lecithin get um, tied up? Does it just kind of like preferentially end up taking care of the dietary fat and and not getting around to taking care of the fat that's been stored in the liver for too long? Yeah. All right. Um, I think that. So your the second part of your question is is a simple one, and I'll answer that first. So um, it is it while it is not the case that uh, so first of all, it is the case that the sunflower lecithin will help you absorb the fat from the diet. Um, it is not the case that that then detracts from its ability to remove the fat from the liver because they're both getting absorbed and then they can both get repackaged. However, it is the case that in that fat will increase the amount of fat that goes through your liver, and that will then um, that will then put a tax on the amount of choline that's required to remove the fat from the liver. And so, if you think about the inputs of fat into the liver, you basically have. Um, I should back up for a second and just say. So fatty liver is basically an in versus out uh, equation where, where out can then be further broken into two components. One is exported and the other is burned for energy. Um, so, you know, some other people might prefer to phrase it as fatty liver equals fat in minus fat minus the sum of fat burned and fat exported or something like that. Um, but the point the point is that there's two, there's one way fat gets into the liver and that's for fat to come in. And there's uh, two ways to get rid of it. One is to export it into the blood and the other is to burn it for energy. And so choline, um, which is what the sunflower lecithin is giving you, is allowing fat to come out of the liver. And then anything that would determine the liver's, uh, the rate at which the liver would beta oxidize fatty acids for energy it would be another way that fat would leave the liver if it's just combusted. Um, and so in terms of the way this, that fat get into the liver, one is from diet and the other is from the blood. Um, the, you know, if you, if it, if you eat the fat and the, well, actually the two ways to get fat into the, into the blood would be eat fat. It travels through the lymph and then gets, and then gets into the general circulation or to release stored fat from adipose tissue. If it's coming from the visceral abdominal fat, it's opening directly into the portal vein and going into the liver. And so that's much more pro fatty liver because all of it goes through the liver. It, all your other fat depots are releasing into the general circulation. So the diet and the general circulation, uh, the diet and the non-visceral fat pads are both releasing uh, fat into the general circulation before it gets to the liver. And so it's some portion of that fat that gets into the liver Whereas the visceral abdominal fat pad is emptying directly into the liver. So all of it goes into the liver. So 
if you put those risks in perspective, the visceral abdominal fat pad is way worse than dietary fat. And it's way worse than, um, than all the other fat pads that can release it because dietary fat and all the other fat pads are going into the blood circulating through the whole body. Only some of it's going into the liver. Now, um, in terms of other dietary inputs, then you could compare that to protein or you could compare it to starch or you could compare it to sugar and then you can compare different fats. And among the different fats, the ones that are more easily beta oxidized are the least likely to increase fatty liver. So MCTs are the least likely because, or I mean, really short chain fatty acids and then MCTs because those are so easily burned for energy. The longer the chain uh, in the fats, so the long chain fats are, are, are going to increase liver fat more. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, although they are bad for the progression of fatty liver from simple fat accumulation, which is called steatosis, to oxidative stress and inflammation, which is called uh, steatohepatitis or NASH, um, and is, is what drives further disease progression towards eventually in a subset of people, uh, cirrhosis and liver failure. Um, polyunsaturated fatty acids are bad for that progression, but because they are more easily beta oxidized for energy, they are less likely to, to increase liver fat than long chain saturated fats are. Um, so there's basically a hierarchy of long chain saturated fats that, and monounsaturated fats are quite similar, maybe a little bit less um, then, then long chain PUFAs are less, and then medium chain fats are even less, and then short chain fats are even less. Um, and then after that, basically sugar is next because sugar can be turned into fat, but sugar is turned into a fat at a very low rate. So in humans, um, generally between one gram and ten grams of of carbohydrate are converted to fat per day. And if you eat a low carbohydrate diet, you're getting about one or two grams of carbohydrate converted to fat. And if you eat a 55% sugar diet, you're going to push that up to 10 grams. But 10 grams of, of carbohydrate converted to fat is very small compared to what even someone on a low carbohydrate, I mean, on a, on a, um, on a low fat, high carbohydrate diet is eating more fat than 10 grams. So so converting sugar to fat is never anywhere near as important as dietary fat because you just the only exception to that rule is when your total carbohydrate exceeds your total energy expenditure and the only time that ever happens is in a hot dog eating contest or a tribal fattening ritual so you know no one no, even someone who's picking out on ice cream is never going to eat more carbohydrate than the total amount of energy that they needed for that day because they have other things in their diet. I mean, even, even ice cream, right? You, it, it, only a portion of that is coming from the sugar. Um, and so if you, if you look at, if you think of the sunflower lecithin as providing choline that is meant to export fat from the liver, then the way that that is getting taxed is by increasing the amount of fat in the liver. And so any fat from the diet is going to be the principal thing in the diet that is increasing liver fat, even though it's not anywhere near as bad as the abdominal fat pad, and even though there are other things such as, as sugar. Protein in the diet is generally going to increase the amount of choline that you have because some of it is synthesized from protein, not just gotten from the diet. So Generally, a you know generally protein is anti fatty liver, um, and in fact, old animal experiments from the first half of the 20th century showed that protein, sulfur amino acids, and choline were the three things that would totally cure fatty liver, whether it was caused by alcohol, sugar, or fat. And that's because um, protein provides sulfur amino acids. Sulfur amino acids synthesize choline. Choline is choline. And so if you provide the precursors or the choline, you're, you're, that, that's how many anti-fatty liver effect. Starch is neutral. Um, sugar is, is slightly pro-fatty liver. Fat is pro-fatty liver. Um, Long-chain saturated fats are the most pro-fatty liver and short-chain uh, and medium-chain fats are the least. 
polyunsaturated fats are in the middle. And all of that is, is it's not, it, when I say pro fatty liver, I just mean that in the equation of fatty liver equals fat in minus the sum of fat burned and fat out, then, um, then that's increasing the fat in part of the equation. But as long as you are increasing the other parts of the equation, fat burned or fat, fat exported, then you you don't wind up with fatty liver if if that sums to zero or negative, right? So if that if that sums to zero, you you have your liver is as fat as it is currently and it doesn't change. If that equation sums to negative, then you're reversing fatty liver over time. Now, in terms of how long that would take, um, that all depends on how negative that equation is, right? So if, if, if fat, if fatty liver, I should say fatty liver progression or the delta of fatty liver equals um, fat in minus the sum of fat burned in plus fat exported. If delta fatty liver is 0.01% per day, then it's going to take you a lot longer to reverse fatty liver than if Delta fatty liver equals negative thirty percent per day, and so I wouldn't want to be on thirty percent per day because that that's a too much stress in the body to move anything that in that quantity that fast. But but the point is that it could take weeks to reverse fatty liver. It could take years depending on on how negative that that equation is. Um, and if if you look at studies that revert that's caused fatty liver by withdrawing choline from the diet, or that, um, or that, or like on TPN where they caused fatty liver by not having choline in the TPN and reversed it, you're generally looking at it taking weeks to reverse fatty liver if or cause it if you are kind of putting the pedal to the metal on that dietary change that you're making. What's TPN? I'm sorry. Total parenteral nutrition is, or TPN is when you are fed a diet completely intravenously. And that's done when uh, there are extreme situations where you're unable to eat. Okay. Um, And anything about imaging the liver, um, fat in the liver? Yeah. So those are, I mean, that, those those studies are based on imaging the liver. And so in studies where imaging the liver was an endpoint, then they set the threshold at whatever they set it at, probably 5% or something like that. Um, then in a matter of weeks, you can change the imaging to have more fat or less fat and you can cross that threshold. Now, Crossing that threshold obviously depends on how far you are away from that threshold as well. You know, so if if you if you set the if you say greater than five percent represents some steatosis and you've gone to seven percent in three weeks, it's probably going to take you three weeks to get back to under five percent um, by just reversing whatever dietary change that was. Um, but it you know if you're if you push that to a much higher fat percentage, it's going to take longer, obviously. But there's, you know, if, if something is um, taking longer than a matter of weeks to show any change on imaging, it is, uh, it is either working very slowly or it's not working. Um, and it would be, it would be, no, if it is working, it's you know it's working more slowly than you want it to. If you're expecting to see a change and you don't, okay. But your and so that I bring back to the other part of your question was was is dietary fat um, detract like detracting from it? It's not that you can't eat dietary fat and and reap the benefits of it, but you are raising the choline requirement when you have more fat in the diet and. Uh, there, you know, in along other animal experiments that were done um, along many decades ago, there was one that showed that if you feed an animal butter or corn oil, you're increasing the choline requirement substantially when you feed butter. And even though butter is is probably good for you, and even though corn oil in the context of fatty liver actually causes animals to go from simple steatosis to NASH, which is, you know, which is going from like a predisposition to a disease state to an active disease state, um, 
it is still the case that choline is uh, that uh, excuse me that corn oil because it's PUFAs is beta oxidized at a higher rate than saturated fats, and so in the equation of uh, delta fatty liver equals fat in minus sum of fat burned plus fat exported, it's uh, it's fat in, but it's also amping up the fat burned part of that equation more than the butter is. And so what you see is it requires a higher choline, a higher uh, choline intake to prevent fat accumulation in the liver there. Um, and so it's it's just a matter of the relative balance of of those of those things. So yeah, I think I think a a, a, a um I think a high fat diet is going to require considerably more choline to export the fatty the uh, fat from the liver. Okay. Um, and just incidentally, so does any sort of like a supplement that is called phosphatidylcholine, if one needed to take something other than sunflower lecithin for a while, would that, um, should it react the same if you're um, gauging your dose on how much choline is in it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Lauren. Thank you for your question. Thank you.